Good day and welcome to my first try of Infinity Battle Report, uh, where I will end up battle reporting my games that I've played so far. Now, the first game I would like to show you would be a game from TRBot season 4 or 5, I'm not quite sure, but basically round 1. We're playing Resilience Operation with 3 rounds and I'm going to be playing Svalheim, just because I wanted to try it out. My first opponent was Pripercarius playing Vanilla Eugene, and we faced on this particular map. The list I end up, ended up going with was the uh, list that was designed to play a variety of armies that don't provide any hard reaction uh, pieces. Generally speaking, I ended up to making a fire team core of orcs, orc and Four Fusiliers, which is this one. Uh, generally speaking, I find this Falaheim that there are a lot of points that I'm floating after adding pieces that I want, which basically means I could end up upgrading the Fusilier to an Orc Feuerbach. The reason why I would I go for Feuerbach is that Feuerbach Orc is quite quite tough to kill because he has two wounds and four armor, and generally speaking, usually he can be revived with the paramedic while also providing a decently a powerful gun in reactive. Then obviously we have a Leankai, which is an absolute must take in Svalaheim, because he's pretty much the only tool that we can use to answer threats like uh, Steel Phalanx would provide, or targets that generally are well digging and they require a basic approach. Then we have a first of the two powerful firebugs, supplemented by Fuzlier for cheap core, and Uma Sorensen, which is basically a vanity piece. I wanted to try out Uma in a sort of competitive list after having some success with her in Val's meme league, but generally speaking she provides a breaker combi which is an absolutely amazing weapon, she provides a climbing plus, a decent specialist with whip 13, and she slots nicely to supplement the Kahu, because Kahu is good over 16 inches and Uma is really good below the 16 inches basically. Um, so generally speaking she's a way to hand down any threats that might run away from Kahu, and she supplements the Kahu's climbing plus very nicely. Group 2, we obviously have another Kahu with a Feuerbach, which is supplemented with a Fusilier Paramedic just for the cheap Harris option, and an Agnes. Agnes, generally speaking, um, she's really good because you pay like 4 extra points over a Fusilier, um, and you get a Nano Pulsar, and she's Whip 13 Specialist, so, you know, this might not seem like much, but this 5% chance on successful whip checks might be relevant most sometimes, but generally speaking she's an Anopulsar specialist and she's really disposable, so she's a good piece to throw into uh, a room or something where you basically have to trade up, and Karhu for a buck really uh, deserves no explanation about it. Uh, then, because we are taking two Karhu for bucks, um, the cool two Karhu foil bugs are really squishy and they tend up to uh, eat dirt after losing a first face to face roll. This means we are taking a trauma dog with it um, in group 2 with two pal bots. So we have an, an option to revive the Karhu without relying on a burst 1 medicates. Because while theoretically you could go with burst 2 in the fire team core, uh, the Harris is not so lucky to have it because once the, once the Karhu goes unconscious, you're left with two models, which means this is a fist check on Medicaid on phase 11, which is very much unreliable. And uh, basically, the trauma dog allows you to revive the Kahu, which I think is very vulnerable, even if we don't do it in every single game. Finally, uh, we're adding one more close assault piece, basically a Beast Hunter. He's the only model with camouflage outside of Puma in Svarleheim, and we all know that camouflage is a really good option. And generally speaking, again, he has an option to punish Steel Phalanx uh, somewhat because of best 2 Heavy Flamethrower and uh, DACCW, which means he can uh, get in there and uh, fork somebody with a Flamer and a double action close combo weapon. Finally, to round up the list, because I have points left and that's WC, we have a Knock and Spitfire. Knock and Spitfire, generally speaking, he works very much uh, like a bullet here, in a way that he's a MIM-6 Spitfire on a BS-12, but he is much easier to hide than the bullet here. He's not hackable, and uh, generally speaking, he doesn't have any of the downsides the car, the bullet here usually has. You don't take an engineer anyways in this particular list, which means the bullet here would be much worse. And finally speaking, because Carlos has forward deployment plus eight, 
This basically means if you go first and you have the option, then by all means just use this for deployment plus eight. But if you don't have the first turn, then by all means you can just set him up second um, somewhere close to your deployment zone and basically treat him like any other bullet here you would have. He doesn't need to do much, he costs only 29 points. If once in a while he gets something to shoot at, then that's fine, that's fine by me. So after that, we're taking. After that, we really rolled up the uh, resilience cards, and basically, I had those cards after selecting. Generally speaking, I don't really have a lot of experience with the uh, with the cards, basically, with the resilience, op resilience operations. Um, I decided to go with appropriate supplies and central. That's because both of them are scored turn two, and the objectives are generally really close to the middle of the table, which means you can hit two birds with one stone. Finally, priority target. Uh, I had choice between priority target and, uh, if I remember correctly, some mission that required pushing a button or something. So generally speaking, priority target is not a big deal because if I plan to kill my opponent anyways, might as well just get one or two extra kills that I wouldn't eventually gain. After that, we wrote the deployment per se. I decided to go hard second, um, choose the deployment sites after the whip roll, and then I found out that I got the first two reds. Uh, to supplement my first turn. Um, generally speaking, as it turns out, this wasn't such a good idea after all, because two reds don't really do anything against camo, and Vanilla Eugene has camos, so uh, it turned out that two reds had more me than my opponent, but you know, um, I, at the time I was choosing this, I thought that this might be a better option than uh, choosing uh, a saturation zone or, or something other like that. So. After that, we rolled up the uh, Vanilla Eugene deployment. And generally speaking, uh, Vanilla Eugene deployment, here's the, the lieutenant, the Dowing lieutenant um, for the Eugene. We have Longia number one, number two, set up to cover the uh, Dowing with a perimeter of deployable weapons, supplemented with a Quang Shi here and a Quang Shi here, making this basically a no go zone uh, for, for Svalenheim because. Uh, because I could theoretically go through one mine, maybe even to second mine, but then again, I have two Quanxis to contend with, and under the end of the road, there is an uh, option uh, to just fail the discover roll. This was obviously uh, th my opponent chose for the priority targets. He decided to go with uh, the Daoying here, um, the Quanxi that's located here, and I think one more Quanxi, which uh, was either this one or that one. So. All of them were quite difficult to get, you, you would think, but the angle that I could kill all of them was from like this side. Because there are no blockers here, I could just gap all three of them with one Kahu, provided that I could get to this location. Uh, then, finally, we have a Monk here, which is located here. Uh, we have uh, another Quang Shi, and then uh, there is Sujan located here, with Crit Cochran ready to push towards the middle. My opponent selected saturation zones from his condition and generally speaking most of his stuff is located on the right side of the table. The right flank is has all of his active pieces and all of his tools that he would be dead use, using to attack me with. However, the other side of his table, which is this side, is very much well covered by disposable chaff protecting his lieutenant. This basically means that I can either go for his lieutenant by killing him and I would have to go through a lot of disposable chaff and mines which is rather inconvenient or I would have to hard press into the location where all of his models are located and he has a lot of tough stuff there. This basically would prove very difficult to attack into and generally this is the case with most of the vanillas but as it turns out the um, the biggest obstacle to, to, to Svalheimer was actually Luna, that was located right, right here on the roof. She had a really good sight lines there and there. This basically means that this side of the table was a no-go zone until I removed um, Luna. So the only really way I could attack to without contending with the Luna was this side. And as I said before, there is just a lot of disposable chaff. So I think this is rather good deployment from uh, from my opponent. Generally speaking, the turrets would be here, um, and then I think like somewhere there. 
I and like there, I thought that this would be beneficial to me, but it turns out the the approach was done by Camo Marcus, which the Libero and the Beast Hunter, uh, which obviously ignored the turrets. So in the first turn, the turrets did absolutely nothing to help me, and in my first turn, uh, this would be the opposite actually. So I ended up uh, with my side of the deployment there. I ended up putting my Fusilier core right here with Liankai. Um, generally speaking, I just put all of them with the Orc just seeing sort of this sideline and I like a little bit of this sideline um, because I didn't really want to contend with Luna. Um, cause I, well, this is technically a gamble. This is not a gamble I'm willing to take against Luna. So I was worried that I would just lose the Orc for free. And uh, no, no, I really expected Haktao. In the end, the Haktao turned out actually to be one to be here, right? So, but at the time I didn't know that. So I wanted to have my orc in a position where just he didn't, he wouldn't be, get killed. Uh, I set up in the, the way that I thought that turrets would slow my opponent down, um, and I really pretty much null deployed with all of my stuff. The fusiliers are located here, covering Liankai, basically. Fusiliers have best to come rifles, they are fine to just defend with in close range. If they have good range, they can pretty much stall even tougher threats. I, I, I can always just trade them if need be. Mm, uh, then finally, we have the Karhu number one is located here with the uh, Agnes and the Fusilier. So, this is the first Harris, which has the option of basically maneuvering through the middle of the table if needed. And then finally we have the final fire team with Umadar, and uh, they have the access to go through the catwalks while avoiding Luna, which provides me an ability to push into the my opponent deployment zone. And finally, uh, the the last part was this was a really big building, but this was a building with white noise on top of it, which basically meant it was useless for my side. What ended up happening was that they, uh, my opponent used the uh, Liberto that was located here, the Liberto, so then spent all of the group 2 orders, started moving through the middle, got here right into the room, basically, and what ended up happening was the Liberto decided to kill the Fusiliers, instead of, I, I dodged with, I discovered him before he got in, I dodged with this guy successfully, Liankai dodged the templates and then this guy basically traded for the for the Liberto. So this is basically the Liberto coming in and again uh, Liberto just comes in, the Fuerbach guy shoots him, the Fusilier shoots him, uh, he templates this way, this way, this guy dodges successfully, this guy goes unconscious which is fine, we kill the Liberto, basically trading one Liberto for one Fusilier and uh, basically like four or five others for my opponent, which is, I think, very, very neat. Generally speaking, Libertos are not that good attacking Fusiliers because, I mean, generally pure, or any fire teams, generally, because you just trade with the bad. Like, what, what do you care that he's 9 points? If my Fusilier is 10 points, that's fine. Even even if I lost 2 Fusiliers, I think that's okay, because one of them goes unconscious, the other one dies, I can still recover, and the Libertos is dead, so I don't have to worry about him in my turn. What ended up also happening with the group 1 orders, um, the beast hunter that was deployed here, he was uh, trying to do a cards and uh, kill the Noken that was located here. He moved in, right here. Um, I yellow discovered with my beast hunter because the turret was right next to him. Then the beast hunter maneuvered all the way around, failed a bunch of whip checks on uh, the HVT located here. I think he was doing the HVT card. And uh, yeah, basically he spent a lot of time maneuvering here in a spot where with very unconsequential whip rolls. Then this Fusilier uh, finally got an 8 zone of control dodge check, stood up. The Beast Hunter decided to fly in throw at him. My Fusilier replied with combi rifle shots. What ended up happening was uh, the Beast Hunter got killed by the Fusilier and the Fusilier survived the flame throw luckily and went prone back. So the, the turn basically ended with my opponent sacrificing all of his orders to accomplish uh, removing this HVT and uh, losing both the Beast Hunter and Liberto, which I think was very successful first turn defense. 
And the first turn defense was done only with Fusilier with combi rifles, pretty much. Because the one the Fusiliers got the Liberto and then the Fusiliers got the Beast Hunter. Um, then I ended started my turn and uh, what I really did in, in, in this turn was that I carefully maneuvered this Harris around to try to avoid the, uh, the turrets and uh, to not get shot by the turret. I ended up trying to discover Luna. Uh, my opponent didn't take the bait, which was, was rightfully so, but I failed the, the discover check on the Luna. I then climbed on top of the truck, tried to shoot Amon, which was there, uh, but I failed my shots and he basically dodged out of the way. So this was really uns really unsuccessful turn of events for group 2 Harrys, and I basically retreated with all of my guys. However, what was uh, much more eventful was this group of uh, this the first group of Harry's team. The Uma removed the turret that was located here. Then I successfully discovered shot Longia that was here. Um, basically got it one burst. Then I discovered shot the the other Longia which was there. I successfully discovered with all three of my shots with a Fuerbach. And then one, the next order, I basically finished it off with the, uh, the Feuerbach and retreated back to, to, to where my original position. I ended up with this uh, careful position here, trying to cover this approach, just because there was a possibility where the uh, Sujan would just basically run all across the table and delete all of my shit, which was obviously something I wanted to prevent with the Kahu. And my fire team basically also tried to discover Luna. That's why this orc, in uh, in two orders, basically moved here and tried to discover shooting Luna. I failed. I then tried to discover shoot a mine that was located here. I ended up discovering the mine, but failed to hit it with like three or four, what well, two or three single firebox shots, which is which is kind of whatever. But uh, what ended up happening was I deleted two Longias and then my opponent killed Liberto and the Beast Hunter in his own turn, which basically uh, made the fact that I was up in attrition because I successfully revived the Fuzier that you remember was killed by Liberto. So basically uh, the state of the turn two would be I have 15 models on the table and my opponent had 11. And he had uh, one turn less to play with. And again, my objectives were to uh, take this objective, this objective, take this objective, and the middle. So basically, as long as I had kept my strength up and I could maneuver into those uh, the middle of the table while preventing my opponent from doing his objectives, I would eventually win. Uh, then my opponent basically started with Festan with revealing a Hector that was again right here. He moved into group one and then basically spent all of NC orders to remove turret 1, remove turret 2, take um, a shot with the uh, orc, wound him once over like 2 or 3 orders. He then deletes this car who was here trying to stop Sujan uh, in like one shot. And uh, then the Hektao tries his luck to finish off the orc, moves out into the open, takes the fight against the orc. This is like burst 3 against burst 1 for the orc. He fails, uh, he whiffs, I roll like a 2 or 3. And uh, Haktao basically explodes to one full back shot, which is very, very lucky on my part. However, I generally think that this was not really something my opponent had to take. Because while this is a, a fight that Haktao is favored with, this is not super unlikely. Like, this is uh, three shots on 14 versus one shot on 11. So this is uh, unnecessary risk, in my opinion. At that point of the time, now, what it would, Sujan was still able to just basically get through because the car who was out of the picture, so he could just play with the on the Sujan. But instead of that, he decided to risk with Hactao. I got very lucky, dated the Hactao, but those things happen in Infinity, you know. Um, then Sujan basically just started running uh, all the way here. He tried to take the orc from close range. I replied with shot. He deleted the orc. Um, the Beast Hunter from around here managed to get two Panzerfaust shots into the Sudan over two orders, but I only ended up putting him in an WI. Um, and then basically the Sudan rushed in, face checked my one, two, uh, sorry, one, sorry, this one's prone, one, two, three Fossiliers and uh, Liang Kai, 
Liang Kai was the only one deciding to dodge. All fusiliers were shooting at the Sujan. And uh, basically, Sujan first tried to contend with Dices against uh, Liang Kai. He failed to finish him off because Liang Kai is quite good at dodging. And uh, after that, he basically removed this fusilier, removed this fusilier, and died to a combi rifle shots, which was, you know, fusiliers like they don't really care that much. They, they have absolutely zero fear in their heart. So it's fine, just just never dodge, never dodge the Shujan. You, you you're dead anyways. Anything, anything those fuzzies get is a bonus. And uh, basically, what turned up was four combi rifle shots into Sujan was enough to to kill him once he was wounded from the uh, Panzer Faust. At that point in time, my opponent lost uh, his Haktao, lost his Sujan, lost his Long Yas, and uh, every basically the only model that he had left was Luna right here. And crit Cochram. That's what the, that was where the only two models that could realistically do anything because everything else had a chain rifle or a Celestial Guide. And I was I had twelve models, of which uh, I had one car who Feuerbach and then a bunch of combi rifles, the knock and spitfire, the beast hunter, which basically meant that I could dominate. My opponent decided to to call the game at this point, and we ended up with nine one in favor of me because. I could, I think, realistically get two targets out of the three, and we agreed that this was very much possible with me having 26 orders to do so, especially with Yankai alive, and I would definitely get all three objectives because there is nothing at this point in time to stop me from, from doing so. Um, so yeah, that was the first game. I really hope that I didn't really bore you that much, guys. Mm, yeah, and uh, let me know whether what do you think this is something you'd be interested in, in watching. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Have a good day. Cheers, bye.